And we have a tradition here. We present you with a golden thumb. It's actually very handsome. And what we didn't say yesterday, some of our guests may not know, these are made by the same people who make the Academy Awards. It's true. So you have the Ebert Fest, oh, uh, Golden Thumb. I'm not supposed to say Academy Award, but uh, Oscar, you, you have the Ebert Fest Roger Golden Thumb. And we're going to do a Q&A. We're going to take that backstage and hold it for you. But can you hold it just for a second? Um, where's our photographer? I know that he likes to get up. Oh, he's not there. He's usually there. But this, this is recording you. They just want to have a picture of you with the golden thumb. Uh, there's someone right there. Um, I, one of the questions that I want to ask that I hope that you do talk about is I noticed in this movie again, there is someone with the whip or cat of nine tails. And in songs from the second floor, there also were whips, but I think there was self-flagellation in that movie. And I think there was some of others as they were walking down the street in songs from the second floor. You don't see that in very many movies. <laughs> so so it's, it's something I'm a little puzzled by and I'd like to, hear what you have to say about that. The other thing that I had to confess to Johan, you know, uh, Nate and I review all the movies before we invite them to Ebert Fest. And so I had seen this movie, and I don't know, this is one of those things that happened, it happened to Gene Siskel once. Roger tells a story about Gene going to the bathroom and something really bizarre happening in a movie, and when Gene came back and people were trying to tell him it happened, Gene didn't know whether they were pulling his leg because it was so out of character with everything else that had happened in the movie that Gene didn't know whether to write that it happened or write that it didn't happen and that someone said it happened. I never saw the scene where those people are being led into that giant barrel and it being set on fire. That wasn't, it, it, it was, either it wasn't in a version that I saw before, or I fell asleep, or <laughs> I went to the uh, ladies' room, and it's just inexplicable, and I'm seeing it today, and I'm back there watching this in horror, and it's going on and on and on, and I'm thinking, how in the heck did I not know that that was in there? So maybe you'll talk about that too. Anyway, let's call Simon Abrams out. He is a film critic for uh, The Village Voice, for RogerEbert.com, and he's written in many other publications as well. Simon, come out and help us with this. Um, first of all, uh, I want to let you know that the movie made me very happy. <laughs> and uh, it, it is quite a novelty item in and of itself. Um, and also, thank you for coming all this way from Stockholm to, uh, of course. to, to be with us. Um, I, I do want to talk about the process of how you and Roy Anderson make these movies, but. Um, First, let's, let's talk about the drum and get the answer to Chaz's question. Okay. Um, it's always been in the film, right? Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> I didn't see it now either, so maybe it's gone. No. Uh, do you want me to say something about the scene? Or, or? Yeah, wh where the scene came from and, and, and how you did it. I think the scene, uh, it's an old idea that Roy have had to make a, a scene about a torture, um, uh, torture machine also being uh, used as uh, entertainment. And he said to us that he had read in the Bible about this, but we couldn't find it in the Bible. And then, but we found out, I think it's a mix of Roy's fantasies, 
but also about um, the Assyrians around uh, 600 years before Christ. They were a very strong, uh, strong society and they had, uh, they developed different kind of, of torture methods and I also did torture for amusement, which this scene is about. And also in, uh, later in, in uh, history in, uh, in Sicily, they made a, a metal bull and then they put a man or a person in the metal bull and then they put fire under it and then when the person screamed from pain he sounded like a bull and it was entertainment so it's about it's about that so why were the soldiers uh, english it has about um i should also tell you that this is one of the scenes that we did we shot all the scenes in our own studios except three scenes this scene we made in in oslo in, in a big uh, studio. Um, what was your question? Uh, oh, uh, why, why the, um, the soldiers that put the... Yeah, okay. Were, it's about uh, he, Roy's interest uh, for uh, historic guilt. So it, it's British uh, soldiers. Um, yeah, it, it's about historic guilt and... and uh, yeah. Uh, okay, we won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> I think he, Roy, Roy has he made a, a short film called World, World of Glory, which is only about historic guilt. And Roy raises the question is, if we can feel guilt for th things that happened earlier in history, and Roy means that he does, and we should. So in that short film, it's about um, Holocaust. Do we have... Should we, can we feel guilt for that? So I think that, that's one of Roy's uh, themes that he's really interested in. Mm -hmm. Well, he certainly invented a, a, a visually impressive torture machine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not quite sure what those horns coming out of the barrel were all about, but they must have served some kind of purpose. Um, and, and then let's talk about the flagellation, about the, yeah. the whipping. Where, where did that come from? I think it's in, in, in the whipping in this film is about power. I think it's, it's they have the power and, and no women in the bar and, and this man is playing on a machine so he has to leave. So I don't think that has anything to do with, with the flagellation or self-flagellation. But, but in, in songs from the second yeah. floor, there were businessmen in suits walking down the street uh, hitting themselves in the back with whips. Yeah. And that happens, for, that's uh, something that, that still happens, I think, in, in uh, religious um, mm -hmm. ways. Um, I think it also, I would guess that Roy uh, also is interested in this, you know, thinking that you should um, be hard on yourself instead of enjoying the moment. I think he, he's more like, you shouldn't have so much rules, you should be open for other people, and, and uh, I think it's about that too. Okay, uh, Simon, what, what, you you've seen this before. What? Uh, actually, for me, this is uh, the first time I'm actually seeing uh, Anderson's latest film. But what I'm struck by what you just said is the idea of there being um, sort of this idea of being hard on yourself, as you just mentioned, and I think that speaks to the complexity of tone and. Uh, Mr. Anderson's movies, and what's interesting is in watching this film, I think of something Anderson said when he said that his movies are a bit monochromatic. They are movies that have um, they have a light that sort of um, his characters cannot escape from. They are a light that is without mercy. But I think the the fact that he said without mercy instead of without cruelty or without pity speaks to the humanism in the film, and I wondered if you could talk a little about the, uh, the way he achieves that kind of delicate and complex tone, and how you worked with him to achieve that with this film. I think this um, style is something that he has developed since starting developing in the 80s, and then we have done uh, variations in this aesthetic style. Um, he's very much inspired by artists in, in uh, painting artist in history. 
And um, I think it also is very much about simplifying the image and make it clearer. And the film is also about trying to see uh, everyday situations in a new way, or, may, or at least that is the ambition in a clearer way, and by reducing uh, things and also reducing, visually reducing, is to something condensed. Talk about the process. Uh, how, how does it get from the idea to the screen? You, you said in your introduction it took four years to make this film. Uh, can you talk a little bit about just the process of, of how you go about making these films? Yeah. Um, I think all these three films in the trilogy are made in about the same way. Not exactly, but, but kind of a related way. And that is that we, Roy has this uh, idea for a film. And for, for this film, he had many ideas ready from the start. For a song from the second floor, I think it was, he had half a script. And, and then scenes, we did scenes, and, and he liked them, and we liked them, and, and then other scenes uh, uh, went into the script. Um, no, it, it, doing a scene starts with Roy talking to the team three months before, or, or two weeks before, and then uh, we decide to go down in, in our studios, and we'll, since every scene is shot with one, made in, in one shot. We place the camera and then the team puts up very quickly, it takes maybe an hour, puts up, we, we and this is a, a collective work. Okay, where should the, where should the window be? Where should the, the door be? Where should the, the main character be and so on? And then you feel, and normally this is really fun and easy and, and, and Always. Uh, and from there, we start building the set more accurately. We're trying to find the actors. And then we do tests, maybe every fourth day or something like that. And then we try the color of, of, of the wall. We try the actors. And Roy also tries the lines. He has written the lines, but then he wants to change. And we try the lighting. And then five days later or ten days later we make another test. So I think that the process is the same always. But, I mean, it sounds like a very slow, um, meticulous process as compared to most films that, in this country at least, independent films are shot yeah. in three or four weeks. Yeah. We try, actually, we, we, we work every day, or five, five or six days a week, trying to be as fast as we can. On the, on the one hand, and, and, and we are a small team, it's about including Roy, we are 10 people. Some days we are 40 people or 60 people, but, but normally we're 10 people. And um, so on the one hand, we work as fast as we can and tr really tries to, to, to do the best we can. On the other hand, Roy wouldn't like us to be faster because he needs to, to see the work and think about it and talk about it. So I think we have found a, way, a good way of doing it in, in a economically uh, and, and uh, artistically way. How do you go about casting the film? Because there's some very strange looking people. <laughs> we have a lot of people in our archives. I, I'm not sure if it's maybe 3,000 people or something. So it, it's people we have, we have made a lot of commercials and we always try to find really good people for each film. But these are, these are not actors, are they? No, or some some are actors. But the costume for this film, we go to our archives, but we also try to find new people. And sometimes we do it by, if, if you have the courage in, in, in everyday life, if, if you're in, on the subway, you talk to someone, and they get very scared, and then you explain. Um, <laughs> and then we have... Um, we have um, uh, casting sessions with, with uh, ads in the newspaper, and, and we have like 500 people coming and so on. So I think that the, the casting is, is uh, really important and part of, of uh, this uh, filmmaking. We use professional actors as well, but it's mainly uh, non-professionals. Like in the scene with um, the older brother 
coming and visiting the mother and his siblings. He's, he's a taxi driver. So he, yeah. So I think it, they always, they and don't know what's, what is going to happen when they say yes. <laughs> <laughs> they have no. <laughs> and if sometimes, because we, you know, we work maybe a month with a scene, put a lot of money and effort in it, if they knew they would have a heart attack, I think. So that's <laughs> it's kind of tricking them into it. But the mother got to stay in the bed the whole time, right? Yeah, she did. And was she really very strong? Uh, yeah, she is. I met her actually. We did that scene, you know, you meet her uh, every third day for a week and a half. And then two years later, I, I met her on a coffee shop in Stockholm. And I came over to her and she hugged me and was really happy. And then she asked me who I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, did she still have the handbag? Uh, she had her own handbag, yeah. Um, Simon? You, had... well, you talked a little about this earlier, but I like, and I find what's most striking about this movie and about Anderson's style is what you mentioned about removing and simplifying the image, the extra uh, material, because um, from what I understand, the sets, a lot of them are constructed with the exceptions um, that you alluded to. So I wondered, how does working with actors and how does that four-year process where you're you know, never really stopping to work, but you're just constantly sort of gradually revisiting, how does that affect um, practically how he achieves that, um, uh, that, that surreal or almost hyper-real kind of effect of the sets, the, the surreality of what we're looking at? Do you mean how the working process affects? Uh... I guess what I'm curious about is um, if when you work with, with Mr. Anderson, how does uh, what we see come about? Is it just sort of a, a set here, uh, the way that the actor moves there? How does, how does it change over time? Is it, is it just sort of a constant and you just sort of move from one scene to the next or is it just one scene that you work over time? It's, normally it's one, we work in one scene and fo focus really much on that and we shoot it and the next day we look at it. If it's good, we, we take down the, the set because uh, if not, we reshoot scenes. So all the three first scenes in this film we did and didn't like, so we recast them and, and changed lighting, and we did them again. Okay. The um, let's talk a little bit about the music in the film because some of some of the music struck me as as very surprising. I wasn't expecting. Okay. Uh, the singing, uh, the, uh, the rock and roll song. Yeah. W where did that come from? The singing is, is a legend in, in Swedish about Limping Lotta. So it's something that uh, people know of, especially in Gothenburg. So it's, it's a Roy's way of showing this myth of, of uh, Limping Lotta. But I mean, that is, that whole scene is, is, is uh, based on a myth? Yeah. And the myth is the same as the scene? If you can't pay for this your is, drink, this, you... Yeah, yeah. And uh, that, uh, that uh, place actually existed in Gothenburg in the 40s. And as I think it still does, but it, somewhere else. Yeah. And you asked about um, uh, Rockabilly's song. That's a uh, uh, homage to Bonuel, because he used it in, in Viridiana. Viridiana which is Roy's favorite uh, movie. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, special. You, um, when we were talking earlier, you were saying that there's, there's a lot of Roy Anderson's life, a lot of autobiography in, in, his, in these films. Um, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I think um, we don't talk about it in that way, but that's a fact that, that these these are not normal settings for, from Sweden today. This is it's a lot of, of Roy's uh, childhood and, and growing up in Gothenburg in, in the 50s. So I think, um, in a way, I think Roy has been very critical of filmmakers like Ingmar Bergman, talking about his problem with his father and, and you know, that kind of uh, problems. Uh, he's not interested in, in and it's, it's uh, 
how do you say self-absorbed? Yeah, self-absorption. Yeah. But the yeah. truth is, I think that's true for for Roy also. He, he tries to talk about the universal, universal uh, subjects, but of course, it has to do with him uh, things he saw when he was young and, and very much. And 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 not. And this he, he has actually talked about how it's not. It's about the lines, but it's also about how you say the lines. So I think he's very fascinated. I think he re recreates how people have said lines since 40 years back or 30 years back. He, he remembers how someone said it with the timing and, and the tone of voice and the rhythm and wants to recreate that. And, and also the repetition of lines. Yeah. Everyone talking on the phone is saying the, yeah. same, the same thing. Um, which we've all said many times before yeah. ourselves. Um, I think maybe it's, it's from Beckett, uh, a bit uh, reference, reference or, or, or uh, stolen from Beckett, yeah. An homage to Beckett. Yeah. Um, let, uh, one more thing and then we'll throw it open to, uh, to questions from the audience. Um, uh, this is a trilogy, so um, in theory, these three films uh, are uh, a, a single unit. Um, wh what is Roy, is Roy Anderson going to make another film? And if so, will it look like these films? We, we uh, actually, he, like yesterday, finished a, a director's comments for a new project. And so we're tr uh, trying to find development money, uh, funds for, for working with that. Uh, I think in my mind, it's, the style will be kind of the same. If you asked Roy, he would say it will be something totally new. Uh, but um, you never know. You never know. It, it will be called, a, we have a working title, and a, that's uh, 1000 and a Night. Did you say so? What? Uh, 1001 thousand thousand Nights. nights. Uh, yeah. so the Arabian Nights? Yeah, uh, it's, it's based on that uh, in a way. And then it has an undertitle which is uh, On Endlessness. So, yeah. uh, the, these films are about endlessness as <laughs> well, I think. Um, but you said you considered this new film perhaps to be the fourth film in the trilogy? Well, we're joking about that, yeah. <laughs> Well, let's see if there are, there are questions from the audience. If you raise your hands, a microphone should come to you. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's someone over here with their hand up. We got a question right to you right here. Okay. Yes, the thing that struck me most was the stationary camera. Once the camera was set, nothing moved during the course of the scene. And a lot of the scenes were, of course, long, like 10, 15 minutes long, especially the one with the king. Uh, how many takes would it usually take to produce an acceptable shot at that, Larry? I think that the average for this film is maybe 20. I think for, for songs from second floor, it was 60 or something like that. The scene with, with the horse riding in, we did, um, it was very complicated, of course, and we did six uh, complete, complete takes. And after the sixth take, the, the, the man on the horse and the owner of the horse said that now it's enough. <laughs> Be because um, the horse was from the beginning a bullfighting horse from Portugal. So they, they had, he had a mission to do this, and he tried to do it better every time. So he, so in the end, it uh, accident would have happened because he was so uh, trying to do his best. Is the I didn't notice. Is the film shot digitally or is it shot on film? Yeah, it's shot digitally, and all the shots are fixed, except actually the the scene with the horse. And maybe you didn't see that, but it's like the the camera uh, pans. Mm -hmm. During the really. scene, but I know I remember from songs of the second floor there is that scene at the train station that yeah. is a tracking shot. Yeah, it's really quite quite dramatic because you're so used to the static yeah, yeah. camera. 
it, uh, it, it surprises you. We did, we did that for you, the living, maybe five or six scenes, just because we wanted to start the scene with this image, but we wanted to end it, end it mm. with that one. Mm -hmm. So there are some pans that you, you, mm. you, you, you don't think about them. Yeah. And occasionally uh, it, it surprises me when uh, one static scene, uh, like in, in, uh, in the room or something, then cuts to a static scene in the corridor. So the, the, the action is related, which generally doesn't happen in most of the scenes in the film. Yeah. Um, so an, another question? Question down to your left. Hi, thank you for your film. I thought it was very funny, but also you know, very human and sort of painful at other parts. Um, I thought that um, it looked like the actors were in whiteface and I wasn't sure uh, if that was just the way that the makeup was or if that was uh, uh, intentional. And uh, if it was intentional, I think I've seen that in, in Waiting for Godot before. Was it, were you trying to like simplify the appearances of the actors in the way that you were? Yeah, in a way, all, all films that Roy has made since 84, I think even the commercials, they always have this white makeup. And the idea, I think, the idea about that is to try to make all the people in the film as, um, you know, this um, rep representing humanity. It's not about exactly that man and his story, and, and we just meet him. You see a situation where Roy wants to say something about how we treat each other or, or something. And then he wants to distance himself from, uh, uh, in a way, yeah. So, sort of Brechtian, you want to stay back? And yeah, and, yes, yeah. And let the... Uh, um, a, a bit of that, yeah. So, so that what's happening is uh, we can analyze it, we can talk about the, the issues that he's raising. Yeah. Um, he doesn't seem to like uh, big business or rich people very much. <laughs> I, th I think he's very much about uh, class problems, or, or he, he, and he comes from simple, uh, simple background. So I think that's very much what uh, his career has been about. Um, a hate, a hate, hate for powerful people um, using people without power or money. It's it's all about that. It's. I, I think. Of course, as with every filmmaker, the irony is he has to go to those people to get the money to make his movie. Yeah, but we have, a, as you know, a different system in Europe. So I think we, the, the fi we had problems with financing You the Living in Sweden, actually. But uh, I think uh, the financing has gone well, and it's. I think he, everybody knows that he knows best how to make a Roy Anderson film, so no, we'd, nobody uh, tell us what to do or, or he wants to change the script or nothing at all. But it is remarkable that the, the, this trilogy spans, what, 15 years or more? Uh, more, yeah. yeah. Uh, another question? Uh, yeah, we have a question. Yeah, we have a question. Bit way up to you, right? Hi, thank you for making your second uh, try to come to Ebert Fest. I'm glad you're here. Uh, one of many delightful visual details I noticed was the uh, gorgeous pink classic car through the window when the soldiers were coming into town. And I wanted to know if that was a, um, a Studebaker um, oh. and, and if there was any story behind that car, which was a pile of junk at the end of the war. No, the, I think it's just a, an American car. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. It's actually made in, in um, do you call it masonite? It's, it's, it's a thin board. Oh, oh it's, it's not a real car. No, it's... It's a two-dimensional car on... on uh, you, can, you can actually take it in your hand and, and, and yeah. hold it like, like that. <laughs> was, was there anything in this film that was actually shot outside? No, nothing. Everything was done in Yeah, studio. we did for, for the, uh, You the Living, we did one scene outside, and it was 
If you have seen the film, people are taking shelter in, in a bus uh, shelter and it's raining a lot and one man is trying to get shelter from the rain, but it's full. Uh, and, that, and then we did the rain, uh, we did the rain, of course, and um, we knew that we had to have, uh, we couldn't have sunshine to get the, the, the right light. And I called the, the specialists about that and they say there, there's no, on that day, on shooting day, there is no sunshine, it's cloudy all day. And then the truth was, it was sunshine all day. <laughs> what, if but, I, what if I may ask is, uh, are we looking at when we look at the skyline then? What's, because I've always wondered that when I watch songs from the second floor and you the living and in, in this film, like if it's, this is indoor, is this painting? How, how, how we, 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 dif we use different techniques, but the most common technique when, when the studio is too small, we have set pieces, models close to the camera. So if, let's say, we should do this in, in, in a studio which is only half uh, the height of this room, then you do this part for real, and then close to the camera, maybe one meter away, you do that part uh, and make it look like... And, and you have a, yeah. a split focal, you can focus near and far at the same time? Yes, but not because we have a split focus, because we have a lens that if we put that model in the right place, it will work. So. Uh -huh. And we have uh, the right amount mm -hmm. of light. So there's a lot of illusion in this yeah, film. Yeah, yes it is. And you don't see it. It's, oh, it's, it's amazing. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, from the balcony to yeah. your right. Right up here. Ah. Hi, I have a question. Uh, thank you, first of all, for being with us. Really appreciate it. The subtitles in the film, do you have any control over that? Sometimes, you know, in this film a little bit, in other films, the nuances and the emotions don't exactly come out as, you know, the director and the writer wanted them. Do you have any control over the subtitles? We, we had control when, when we made them, uh, so that's very important, but, but uh, we can... Uh, over the English subtitles. Yeah, we have, we have control over that, but what's done, this... Um, is there something that we should change, if I say it like that? Okay. Yeah, do, you, do, you speak, do you speak Swedish? I, I can say that we are very aware of that it's very important and difficult to make a good translation and understand the humor and understand everything, and, and we try to do it as best as we can. Uh, one final question. Towards the back of the theater, on your left. Could you speak, please, to the two scenes that follow the title Homo sapiens? the electroshock, apparently, of the monkey, and then the incineration of the African slaves and the onlooking of the upper crust. What was that all about? I think the monkey scene is, it's just about what you see, that, that this, we do these things uh, to animals, and, uh, and uh, you have the, the, the woman standing and talking, and she's very cold about it and, and unemotional. I think that scene is just about that. And, and the, the research images we made are more horrifying than, than the scene. Um, with, that wasn't a real monkey, was no, it? Uh, no, it wasn't. Roy actually got a really funny question in, in Venice about that scene when a, a, rep, a journalist stood up and said, Mr. Anderson, did you or did you not put electric shocks into that monkey? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's, of course, it's, it's um, a fake monkey. I think the scene with um, the slaves, and um, I said something about that before. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Simon, do you want to give us your interpretation of those two scenes? 
I mean, it's what's striking about them is they establish and reestablish the sort of um, the way that the, the phrase that people say over the phone. They're they're ignoring what's right in front of them. They're ignoring the pain of the people that's right in front of their face, or in the case of the phone calls that are, you know, just over the line with them. They, it's just a matter of saying, "How are you? Are you? What's going on with you? Are you okay?" And and at that point, it's you, you can't escape. The, the, what's right in front of you, the, the pain of this poor animal. Yeah, the, the irony uh, that's present in the scene. Well, listen, uh, Johan, we thank you so much for coming yeah, all this way and, and bringing the film. Uh, and uh, I, I should say that, that this audience was far more receptive of this film than 10 years ago when we showed songs from the second floor. And the first question Roger got was, why in the hell did you show us that film? Yeah. Is it okay if I take an image of you? We will do this a few times, but we take the first time. Oh, he's doing a panorama. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much.